Okay. The following interview was conducted with Gerald L. Lytle, Professor Emeritus of Materials Engineering for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, October 22, 2009 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. I should also say that Professor Lytle is back on behalf of the 50th anniversary of this college. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Okay. Uh, I grew up in western Minnesota in a small town called Fergus Falls, which is a, about the size of West Lafayette in terms of people in there. And uh, I was a member of a family of five children. I was the fourth, and uh, the family spanned 25 years from the youngest to the oldest. So I was the youngest of the oldest group and the oldest of the youngest group, because there was 15 years between me and my youngest brother, and six plus years between myself and my next brother up. And uh, What was grade school like? Grade school went by with a, with a whiz. Uh, I enjoyed going to school. Uh, and as I frequently tell people that back in those days, in, which was in the 40s, uh, in the late 30s and 40s, there weren't any buses. You walked to school. And so I would frequently say I had to walk to school and then walk home for lunch and then back to school and uh, through two or three feet of snow at times in the winter. But. Uh, it was a memorable time. Right. And then, we, then let's talk a little bit about high school. And then you were involved with athletics. I was involved with athletics. Uh, I was blessed with being fast and uh, quick, and I was heavy enough. So the football team pulled me in early. Uh, I played four years of varsity in high school, and I was on the track team, and I played basketball and. Uh, since I wear glasses, that was not too good because somebody said, "Where's?" I'd say, "Where's the net on the on the basket?" And that was somewhat of a problem. But uh, football was my forte, and that's how I got to go to college. Was on a football scholarship. Your team did pretty well, I understand. Uh, yes, uh, in the four years, I think I was. We only lost like three games in four years. In my senior year, we were undefeated, and. Uh, uh, what position did you play? I played, um, we played many formations, so I was either the quarterback, the tailback, or the fullback, depending upon which formation we were playing. Okay. And there, and uh, this was in the era of, I played with leather helmets to start with, and so we moved into the plastic helmets later. Uh, and. Uh, uh, it, it was an enjoyable time in high school, and uh, uh, say uh, it it gave me the avenue into uh, going on to college. Okay. In there. Uh, and then let then move on to the, how did you happen to get to Purdue? Uh, Purdue was one of the four schools that recruited me. I was being recruited. Well, there were more. Than, there were some small schools in Minnesota that were after me, but in uh, 1950, I was recruited by Purdue. Tennessee and Harvard were the three major ones after me, and uh, uh, I chose Purdue because I really wanted to be an engineer, and uh, didn't choose Harvard because they didn't have engineering, and uh, all they could offer me was a 3-2 program, three years at Harvard and two at that place down the river called MIT in there, and I, and I said, why shouldn't one spend five years when I can get out in four? You know, so when you're young, you're not quite as smart as you might be. But uh, what was the program of studies you took in high school? Was it sort of college prep or? Uh, yeah, and, and those you always had an interest in engineering. I always had an interest in engineering, and uh, uh, the high school I went to was essentially all college prep. I mean, there was a technology STEM, but it was very few uh, people went through it in that era. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and I, I just loved mathematics and my oldest brother uh, wound up as a civil engineer when he came back from World War II and my third one in the family, Donnie, was the an architect. So I was sort of following them uh, into technology to kinds of things. Okay. But, well, tell us a little about campus when you were here as a student. 
Hmm. Well, campus was very interesting. It was very different back in those days. It was small. I forget seven, seventy-five hundred students in there, and vast majority men uh, in there. And uh, uh, I arrived on campus, never having been here before. Uh, you didn't come down. They didn't have anything like a. Did you come before you started? Uh, or not? No, my contact with. Purdue was via the basketball coaches at the time, and the football coach was at the University of Minnesota, so I met them in Minneapolis, St. Paul, instead of coming sure. all the way down here. Okay. But I arrived here a day before I could get in to carry, uh, before practices started, and uh, uh, Fred Hovde had gone to the University of Minnesota, and he had been fraternity brothers with some people I knew in my hometown. And these fellows took me aside when they knew I was coming here and said, say, Jerry, when you get down there, go rap on Hovde's door and tell him to remind that I was supposed to remind him about things they mentioned. Now, they evidently led me astray because they mentioned some things in which was a little bit nebulous that Fred mm -hmm. did as an undergraduate. Right. So I'm sure the president was a little <laughs> concerned about this young kid showing up at his doorstep. But to be honest, I mean, he, he let me in and we had maybe 15, 20 minutes at least uh, conversation. Super. Over in Hovde Hall, right? Over in Hovde Hall in <laughs> his office. Good. So, uh, That's a good starting point. <laughs> that's, that, that was a good good place in there and, yeah. uh, and you know Purdue was at that time essentially engineering and agriculture and uh, I wanted to be an engineer but didn't know what uh, I uh, one of the history professors here at the time uh, grew up not far from my hometown and he knew I was coming uh, and he got me introduced to uh, a number of faculty in and uh, the man who was head of the metallurgical program at that time was at uh, uh, the house and uh, I was there. He would invite me to come v see people. And he intrigued me in, with the idea. He said, well, metallurgical engineering is only for the best students on campus. So it's a challenge. If you want to come and be the very best, you come to my program. Well, he threw the gauntlet down, and I just couldn't resist. Uh, <laughs> gotcha. It sounded intriguing, and that was uh, Bray who was uh, talking me into coming. And he enticed you to come. He enticed me to, right. to uh, join the metallurgical program at that time. And um, look, look back, I never regretted it. You never it. looked uh, back. I, I mean, it was, it was very good, uh, a nice time. and. Uh, uh, Did you join a fraternity while you were here? Yes, oh. I was involved with uh, Phi Kappa Ta, which no longer exists. Oh, okay. It, uh, it was the building right next to the parking garage uh, over across from the materials and electrical engineering from what used to be the main entrance to the campus. Okay. In there. And, uh, off Northwestern. Right off Northwestern, yes. and. Uh, how did the football go, though? You didn't play. I didn't stay in. Uh, the first year, I had hurt my shoulders in high school some, and I thought I could survive with them. And uh, during the first year, and that was the first year freshmen were eligible, so I was involved with practicing at time. For researchers, you said there were really two teams. One, one was the freshman team, and then the other were the sophomores, juniors, and seniors at that time? No, at that oh, time. Oh, it was all the same? It was okay. all the same. Okay, because I mean, maybe it was earlier. There used to be a junior varsity or something like yeah. that. No, no. no. Okay. It was all, all the same. Everybody was in there, and uh, I dislocated my right shoulder two or three times, and uh, after the last time, uh, I made the decision that you know it, it just wasn't going to work, right. and I had looked at the surgery at the time, what you could do to repair it, and I felt it really wasn't good. And uh, Purdue was very good to me. Uh, I was probably one of the very few on the football team that was on an academic scholarship at the time, so that continued on, and uh, they arranged for me to work. Uh, downtown in there so I earned my way through Good. that way instead Good. of the, the football and so, right. so as I tell people I came here I flunked football 
And so I had to go to my fallback position, which was to become a professor eventually. <laughs> <Okay. You> know, <laughs> <but>. Moving onward. <laughs> yeah. uh, then after, uh, did you stay in Kerry Quad the whole time, or did you live the fraternity? No, I lived okay. in the fraternity. I, okay. I moved into the fraternity in my, uh, what, junior year, I guess. Okay. okay. Uh, in there. And that was in part because it was a matter of price. At that time, I mean, if you were in the, a carry quad, you paid the regular rate whether you ate there or not. Well, I worked five, six nights a week over dinner downtown, and uh, I had to pay whether I ate it or not. Uh, okay. At fraternity, I didn't have to pay that, so sure. okay. it was better for me to move over there. Sure. Yeah. Where were you working at, a restaurant downtown? No. Oh. It was called the Elks Club. Which the is old, now out there in 52. Yeah, the Elks Club was downtown, oh heavens, um, but between 4th and 5th uh, off of South Street. What's there now? Uh, the um, Columbia? No. Um, I think that's where the, uh, uh, oh, it's a government building down there, right well, there. The, uh, yeah. The, it was right, right off right, of right across the can caddy corner from the courthouse yeah. is the uh, services nurse building or whatever. Yeah, but that's way down. No, this was up, you know, where the oh, railroad right tracks used to go down. On 5th Street. On 5th Street. Right, okay. Right, right off of 5th Street in there, one block off of Main. Okay. Is, is where uh, uh, there was an outstanding elk club there back in the day. Everybody came and ate there for lunch sure. and the business people. So that was my employer for... Sounds good. Three years. That's um, very good. Yeah. 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 Then after you, um, after graduated, you uh, was there any military service? Did you have to serve in the military? <laughs> uh, yeah, I I was in the Army ROTC. So Here when I graduated, I was commissioned. Okay. But uh, during my junior year, a revolution took place in engineering nationwide. It moved into uh, a, a science base. And I quickly saw that the education I had been getting here at Purdue was not the up-to-date modern one that was evolving. In fact, that's the time when Purdue hired Reinhard Schumann to come here, and he brought the science base into that program. So it became obvious to me that I, I needed to go on to school. All right, so because I went on to graduate school and stayed here to do it, uh, my commission, uh, I was in the reserve, but I wasn't called up at that time. And uh, I wound up eventually going on duty for a very short time in 1960. But I actually got out early because I, it was discovered that my shoulder problem here actually made me ineligible to be an officer. Interesting. And, which was interesting, and I kept saying it, but that's all right. Uh, you know, as an officer, my sidearm was a 45. If I was an enlisted man, uh, it was an M1, and that went up on the shoulder, and, uh, you know, that would do more damage. But an enlisted man, that, that didn't make any difference. So, so, <laughs> so I, I got out early, and uh, uh, okay. then when I joined the faculty here. You had, uh, did you get, you already had your Ph.D. at that time? Or? Yes, yes, okay. yes. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about the early days and you were, uh, when you first came, 59. Or did you just start your research then or you? No, I, I joined here, uh, 59 is when I became an assistant professor. Here. Okay, uh, but I, be, you were here before that? I was a graduate student here oh. from 55 on until uh, 59 uh, when I got my PhD and then I joined the faculty okay. in there and uh, again got involved in the early days. Uh, that was when the materials research laboratories started throughout the country and they were funded by ARPA, the Applied Research Projects Agency, and I as a young assistant professor got to be involved with writing the grant that went across physics, chemistry, uh, materials, and electrical engineering at the time. And uh, we received a large grant that was 
responsible really for starting a lot of interdisciplinary research here at Purdue. Uh, a lot of that was not very common in mm -hmm. that era, but through the materials research laboratory funding, uh, there was money to do cross-disciplinary work. And uh, I had the opportunity to work with physics professors, chemistry professors, electrical engineering professors all around. And uh, it enabled me to do something I was very interested in. I was very much involved with starting up uh, central facilities. It was my belief at the time, and still do, that for large equipment, we are all better off if we can buy the very best there is and then share, yeah. much like we learned in kindergarten in there. However, I didn't realize that that was not the thing that people did in those days. I mean, everybody wanted their own piece here and this piece here, and sharing with central facilities was not a straightforward, simple task to get people convinced to do. To buy into it. Uh, that's right. It, it was a slow buy-in okay. in there, but uh, it got me involved in, you know, I, I was involved with starting uh, central facilities for x-ray scattering, and I was involved with Roberto Colella at Physics uh, on that, and uh, in uh, microscopy, uh, electron microscopy, because up until that time there wasn't an electron microscope on campus. So we brought the first one in and used it to share in there. And then we also got involved with uh, a central crystal growing facility that uh, uh, a number of us were involved with, including George Honig, a chemistry professor here. Right. And, uh, and we would grow crystals essentially on rec demand from researchers uh, at the time. And this was coming off into the area of the semiconductor research going on. So compound semiconductors were of interest in those days and uh, for people to get involved with. So it, it was a lot of transition in how research was being done in the materials area here on campus. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, you, the building, that you, what about facilities for the lab? Did you have work? <laughs> That must have been a challenge. Well, it was always a challenge. <coughs> uh, Space. Part in the in the ARPA program, part of the re requirement that came with that program was that Purdue would build some space for the materials research lab. And at the time, what they did was build an addition onto the physics building that was dedicated for part for uh, the materials research people. Sure. So that opened up space for those of us who were involved with that research program and uh, getting into laboratories. We actually had offices over there, uh, but not all. It wasn't enough space for everything. So there were facilities in the old, what was the Zen Kemenet Kemen built building right, in there, yeah. which is now chemical engineering sure. uh, in there, and the physics building and electrical engineering. Uh, so we had some of the labs distributed yeah. in, in uh, sure. school spaces rather than uh, the add-on uh, MRL space. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, you want to talk a little about your research and that you've been involved in? You mentioned you address it with the lab, but also your x-ray. Well, I, I, got, I got involved with, uh, my, my research was predominantly around the characterization of materials in various states to be used, and as such, uh, I used X-ray scattering to characterize the atomic arrangements in there. I used transmission electron microscope to look at the various small elements of the microstructure in there, and I, I was blessed because of that, that I could move with whatever material was of interest. Right, yeah. So I worked in metals, I worked in ceramics, I worked in polymers. I worked a lot in semiconductors. Um, I got involved with uh, thin film uh, research uh, back in the early 60s. Uh, hmm. And uh, that got involved with a lot of the work that we were, got into with physics and electrical engineering throughout the mid and later 60s in uh, 
uh, thin film, uh, semiconducting materials. Because sure. I had spent a, a part of a year at uh, Murray Hill at Bell Labs, and I was introduced to uh, the concept and the use of sputtering for making thin films and other technologies for making it. So I brought that back. But I, I was, I, so I could move from one area to another very easily because I was in the characterization game. And it allowed me to interact with a whole host of people. So right. Sounds like it, All right. If you look at my publication list, the Which majority is? have other faculty members' names on it as well as mine and students' names. Uh, so I had, uh, had a lot of fun. I did a bunch of work with Jerry Nudek in electrical engineering. I even did some with Dick Grace. Uh, and there, but and a lot with some of the physics people sure. and George Honig in chemistry, uh, and uh, that opened up the avenue for my research. People around the country recognized that I, I was interested in that, and so I got called in early in the game in the 1970s. Yeah, that the concept of using high energy sources of x-ray, the so-called synchrotrons, uh, which are just a large tube where you run charged particles at the speed of light and get x-rays off. And this was, they were opening one at Brookhaven National Lab in Long Island. And I was able to get together with faculty at what, five other universities here in the Midwest. And uh, we got funding to design and build a beam line for all of us to share, and uh, I was the sort of manager and coordinator of getting that done, so I ran that program for oh, 20, 25 years, uh, and, uh, and I had students who would say, that was terrible, you're going to have to, uh, they tell the young students, you're going to have to go with Lidl to camp, because we'd go out to Long Island, where Brookhaven is and, and do get their research going. And in the early days before the computers were as reliable as they became in the 90s, you had to be there. Somebody had to be at the experiment 24 hours a day. I would imagine. <clears throat> and uh, so it was always a question, would the students last as long as I could without sleep? <laughs> Never lost that game. <laughs> oh but, dear. Uh, <laughs> let's, yeah. let's, and you were the director of that X-ray facility. I was the director of that right. facility. Is that still going here at Purdue? Or? Uh, yes, the beam line is still going. It, it was picked up after I retired in '99 as part of uh, the the actual uh, facility out there is run by them rather than a university okay. now. But it's the beam line is still there and still running. The last I heard, in there. seems to be okay. Seems to be okay. It's okay. it's been updated. Oh sure. A number of times over yeah. the years. How about funding in those days? Well, funding was much different in the early days. I mean, the uh, attitude at Purdue was such that you know, research. We were really not a research university in the fifties. We became one starting into the 60s and involved. And as a faculty member, the pressure on us in that era to you know, get funding for research and support your students and do everything was not uh, really something that was pushed by the administration at all. And that, of course, has changed over sure, the years. Right. Is that, uh, we, and to be honest, there was, uh, a lot of it was you looked for funding from foundations, maybe, or, or from the National Science Foundation. And it wasn't until into the late 50s, early 60s that they moved into all the other government agencies right. and sought funding right. in there. And uh, Well, but, the state funding was a lot much different in those days, too. The, yeah, right? if I recall correctly, uh, we were running at those days that the operating budget for the university was like 85, 90 percent state funds and tuition and fees. And I don't know where it is now, probably about 30 or less. It's uh, immeasurably, as in you there. know. But uh, no, I, I, that was a, a major sure. transition in, for the in uh, That's right. Era. Oh, yeah. 
How about now, let's talk a little bit about this, the head of the school, and how did that come about initially? Here in 78 <laughs> was your big year. In 78 was a big year, yeah. yeah. I, I got involved with a lot of things, uh, and that's where my assistant, Donna, said, you know, I should have learned to say no more frequently in there. Uh, the uh, current head at the time, Bob Vest, and, and he wanted to step down, so they started a search committee. Was the searching was a little different in those days, though, right? Well, at, at that time it was it was moving almost was into moving, what it is. It I was, remember it was that not as, It was not as rigid a, a formality and all of the regulations right. as it is now. Right. But it was still was, there was. It a, was moving in that direction. Yeah. And uh, one day the dean of engineering knocked on my door and said, Jerry. The entire faculty was in my office, and they said they want you to take over head. <laughs> now, I hadn't applied for it. I, I, I you know, I, I was, and so I, in my sweet innocence, said yes. And uh, as my wife would say, you know, frequently over my life, one of the f items I would come home and say, say "Oh, by the way." I did that when I accepted the faculty position initially at Purdue, and I did it when I said, hey, I, I said, oh, by the way, John Hancock was in my office today, and he offered me the headship. And I said, yes. And of course, she said, what do you mean you said yes without talking to me? But uh, <laughs> no, I mean, it was, it, it was an interesting era. It's a long, long span. And I, you know, I was head from 78 till 99. And uh, it was an era of transition. Um, I made a decision with the faculty support in there at the time to work on build, rebuilding the, uh, the school. And uh, um, I sweet talked them into, well, let's build it with young people rather than go out getting people who have their name and their reputation already up there. And I said, because I wanted, I wanted to get people who were on the cutting edge of the new uh, parts of the field coming out. So we went out to recruit, you know, fresh meat right. in there rather than the old fogies. And for the most part, we did that. Uh, right. we, we did hire a couple of older people. Talk a little bit, uh, interject, Kim and Matt, how that, uh, that change became, the metallurgy got... Uh, well, they... They, well, they, the researchers they may have heard Kim and Matt, and so that's why. I well, Kim and Matt there. was the building, and, sure. and, and it was the program. Uh, the uh, uh, metallurgy program started within chemical engineering in the early 30s right. in there, uh, and uh, so it was a option within chemical engineering. Sure. And then it, it developed into its own program and to I forget what he was called. He was, it wasn't. It wasn't a head. You know, he was the director of that program. Sure. And when the university went out in the fifties to hire someone to move that program forward, it was, in my understanding, it was that they were going to bring someone in and split it off as a separate school. And that's when when they hired Reinhard Schumann. And uh, after he had been there a year or two, they formally split the thing into two administrative units okay. in there. And uh, but we were housed in the same building sure. for a number of years. All right. But uh, but it was it was an era of interest. Um, one thing in the research program I got involved with big time in the last twenty years or so of my uh, maybe not quite twenty. Uh, uh, when high temperature superconductivity hit this place, um, yeah, I was going to ask you about that early kind of on uh, <laughs> in, in the mid '80s. You know that was a major revelation in there, and uh, funding became available. Um, the state funded us uh, on some incubation money in high temperature superconductivity, and I was the director of that from right. the state funds in there and um, then we got funding through Congress on uh, uh, a multi-university program again and so that was a few million dollars a year that uh, there were people from five and six universities at the end right. 
uh, that were involved uh, with that. And again, the interdisciplinary part, whether they were physicists, chemists, materials people, electrical engineering people, uh, from all around. And it, it was a most interesting aspect of things. But sort of a side story on that. Um, about six months before the high temperature superconductivity hit the physics community, uh, which was an overnight revelation. I mean, it just changed the world practically in uh, uh, solid state or condensed matter physics, it was called now. Uh, that one of the theoretical physicists here at Purdue came into my office and said, you know, Jerry, uh, I think uh, I've found a, a compound. He said, you know, you know that if hydrogen were a solid, Theoretically, it should be a room temperature superconductor. And I said, and he said, if we, if that can happen, this would revolutionize the world in there. And um, uh, if you look way back into the 50s, there was a lot when it moved from two or three Kelvin up to 11 Kelvin. Uh, and I said, well, and, and he had found this company. Said, now we need to get together, and uh, with your crystal growth facility people and others, let's. Let's see if we can make this compound. Well, the compound was lithium beryllium hydride. And lithium anything and beryllium anything is are, are messy to work with, and the combination was really different. And we we never made it, but it, had we he he told me that if we could do it, he said, you go we'd go to the physics community, report on this, and they would go crazy. I said people would be screaming and climbing all over the well, he predicted exactly what happened at the American Physical Society meeting when the, the fellows over in Europe came up with the, okay. a high temperature superconductor that got up over liquid nitrogen temperature and the transition. You know, I, and it, it was fun. I mean, I, I got to great? work with a whole range of things in there. Right. What about the patent? Can you to make a couple comments on the patent that you got? Oh, the patent. Yeah. The patent was related to uh, the design of the uh, uh, beam line at Brookhaven for the uh, synchrotron uh, X-ray source, and it was a patent uh, we got on the uh, monochromator uh, right. set up for that. Uh, I think it was. They wanted to get the patent. There was no real interest of anybody ever redoing it exactly that way. And in fact, five years later, we actually redesigned it. <laughs> <laughs> in there, so. uh, you talk uh, how about that University Materials Council. Uh, you were the founding chairman. I was the founding the, yeah. chairman. Uh, that was housed here at Purdue. No, oh. no, no. The University Materials Council was uh, involved with uh, uh, getting all of the heads of materials departments and leaders in the materials laboratories around the country together to, uh, in essence, foster the materials uh, area for research and communications about what it is and what it does. Uh, so it was a mechanism to do some sharing. Yeah. Uh, of information around uh, the schools in the country and uh, laboratory leaders in uh, in the country, and face it, lobby Congress and sure. uh, right. uh, uh, get be some, an advocate. It would be an Does advocate it? for the field. That's right. That's right. Yeah, you know, and so I, that was fun. I mean, yeah. It was a, a good thing to start. You were talking. We were talking about as being the head. What, what about the curriculum? How did that change over time? Because you were trying to bring. We're bringing it up. Well, yeah, the, a major change came, and I was involved with uh, a national study on uh, in the late 80s for the new direction of the field that was going in. And uh, that study laid out the foundation for where the field should go. And it was developed upon four cornerstones, so structure, properties, right. processing, and performance of materials. And the idea was that, you know, materials covers metals, ceramics, polymers, uh, semiconductors, you name it. 
and it was well beyond any possibility of your covering everything if you were going to try to cover the various materials. And there was an interest of bringing the materials community into one central focus uh, for education instead of having metallurgical engineering, ceramic engineering, polymer engineering, glass engineering, you name it, have a materials engineer. Because a lot of the concepts of the structure of materials permeates all of them, you know, so it doesn't make any difference which ones you're talking about. And many of the processing techniques are the same in concept for metals, ceramics, polymers, and sure. so it made it uh, better to create a foundation program that was designed around those four aspects of the field. And I, I was involved with it nationally, and uh, so I had a little uh, upfront information before it really, the book hit uh, the press, and I came back and told the faculty, and I said, you know, handed them uh, the draft of the report that was coming out. This is what our field's going to look like in the 90s. Uh, and, uh, you know, these are the concepts you've got to get in. I said, now the name of the game is none of the courses on the books today can exist tomorrow. You know, go away with this and come back and tell me what it is you're going to have in the, in the new program. And they did. It took about a year. Um, and the uh, only fight I had with the faculty was, oh, they wanted one more lab or one more lecture, because I had given them. I said, we, we have resources for a certain number of laboratories and a certain number of lecture courses, and that's it. So I, and, uh, they, and I, I didn't lose that battle. And they still. <laughs> They kept within <laughs> what I said we could afford <laughs> with the facilities. <laughs> but, uh, oh. yeah. How about that, um, uh, I mentioned this earlier off camera, the National Technical University as one of the earliest distant learning. Yeah, that was an interesting aspect. I was actually a member of that faculty uh, for the materials aspect. That was out in Colorado. It was centered out there. They had started. Uh, early on, on developing uh, courses for industry. I mean, they were focused courses for specific topics for a company or an industry sure. group, and they were very good at that. So they were running seminars in that. And uh, uh, one of the fellows running that said, well, why don't we just pick up and, uh, you know, run classes out here? You know, what the concept was is they had no faculty. I mean, what they were was a retransmission. They had access to the satellites in there. And so Purdue, back in the early days, you know, did have some television capabilities. A little crude, but, uh, and, uh, you know, when the Potter building went up, uh, we were uh, courses that we taught on campus here. We're being from the we're, we're we're recorded and sent out to the National Technological University, and they rebroadcast it. So there was an agreement between Purdue and them, and the same thing. MIT did it. North Carolina State University. I mean, a whole host did a lot of that kind of thing, and so students could get a degree you know, maybe a course from this university, that university, and they combined, and uh, we who were on the faculty, you know, would stipulate which types of courses they had to have to get the degree in it. But uh, it was an interesting thing, and uh, it sort of folded in there just at the point when I thought it'd be interesting because capability came down um, where bandwidth was available at night off of the seminar, uh, off the satellites, and they had come up with a small receiver that would sit on a window. And so uh, uh, the concept was is that students could, for uh, essentially it was a throwaway uh, receiver that they, they would get, the students would get that when they registered. They would download a series of lectures uh, overnight they could pick it up on their computer, 
read it, do whatever they had to do, and go on. And uh, it was a great concept on you know the retransmission because other, before that they had to transmit to a central facility, sure. you know, much like uh, the labs here on campus have right. the capability of. But uh, that was that was. A, That's a very. Good, it was yeah. an educational one. Sure, yeah. sure. That uh, career resource center for material science and engineering. You yeah. Pulled. What was? The, tell us a little bit about that. The career resource center. Uh, it, it came out of uh, the Rockefeller Foundation. There was a study made in the early '90s that there was a dearth of information for students to make career choices in across the spectrum, and particularly in science and engineering. So the Rockefeller Foundation went out basically to professional societies and uh, said, you know, we'll give you money and uh, we have concepts to what we think you should do in, in developing this kind of thing. And uh, at that time I was the head honcho, so to speak, at uh, one of the, well, a couple of the materials society in education. And so I got pulled into the Rockefeller Foundation early to get this up and running. And th what the concept was to do is to get information out. So we surveyed uh, the graduates of universities all around the country, and I, you can imagine, I, I went to all the sister universities around the country and I said, give me your names and addresses of your alums. Uh, I had a few problems with getting that, but we worked around it, you know, that, <laughs> but we got a sampling across the country to survey what people did, you know, because uh, that was lacking. And so you got a degree in something from somewhere, but what were you doing 10 years later? And what was your reflection back upon your education? And you know, uh, what were the characteristics of people working in the field in various jobs? So we surveyed a lot of people around, uh, and uh, we did interviews with people uh, in industry uh, uh, on site. Uh, That's pretty comprehensive. That's a big. Oh yeah, it, it was a number of years, and and sure. we had to generate a website. Uh, we had to generate some printed materials for it, and uh, uh, it was a, a lot of fun getting involved with it. Uh, uh, it still exists out there. I don't think it really has been picked up that much, uh, you know. But it it came to fruition, and. The one benefit that I had in there, be, because I was involved in, the, I was running this whole thing for the materials community sure. nationwide, and uh, I needed to get a website up and running. Now this was in the 90s in there. Now you just didn't walk across the street and find somebody who was conversant with websites and get it going. And I quickly found it was going to cost us a fortune to hire a commercial firm. So I said, well, why don't I just locate a couple of enterprising students and let's form our own little company within Purdue, uh, which didn't, <laughs> and I did. I, I had a, a group that uh, actually at one time we had three people and they were you know, hired within the School of Materials Engineering because I could do it that way. as. Uh, temporary employees, but they were professionals, they were in the professional staff. And uh, you know, I, I had people who were, could do website designs, who could do uh, uh, hard copy stuff and... Uh, very talented with very what Very talented and, uh, and actually as it turned out, people found out that I had this group with capability and we got hired to do things for chemistry here and a couple of other programs on campus. <laughs> we did uh, did work for a couple of different industries uh, out there on developing website. And, and thing we, one thing we were interested in was developing teaching kind of things. So how would you set up a virtual laboratory? Uh, you know, so it, it, it was a lot of fun and uh, 
it served the purpose I needed for the Career Resource Center, but also uh, it it got going and it had its own position going, but I could never get it integrated within Purdue. <laughs> so when I retired, it disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now you've been pretty active in a lot of the. You've been uh, with that uh, business modernization of technology, the former Corporation for Science. Oh, yeah, that was a state-run organization. Sure, Indiana. Back in the whatever '80s, somewhere, or, mm -hmm. <coughs> and that was a concept of getting help for uh, startup companies or small companies to get things going. Was to uh, have technical people and business people who could sit down with these people and give them the assistance to go. Original concept was very good. Uh, and we actually had money from the state. So we could provide these companies with some money to get over the ledge they needed to to get the thing going. Sure. <coughs> and with the stipulation that if they made it, and most of these were new companies, so these were people who had ideas and wanted to start ups. And if they made money, they paid back in there. And after the first four or five years, there were a number of small companies in Indiana that had actually made it and were making money. And money was coming back in to keep this program going. Then there was a change in administration <coughs> and they killed it. <laughs> so, uh, and it was uh, good. How about the American Society for Engineering Education? That's been one you've been involved in. We, the American Society for Engineering Education? Oh. Uh, You've helped yeah, a little bit with that. I, I was in. I was involved with engineering education sure. uh, heavily uh, uh, in professional societies in the materials yes, research. Yes, read addresses that. Uh -huh. And in uh, a couple of other professional. And I was uh, I heavily involved in the accreditation board for engineering and technology for twenty plus years, uh, and uh, had worked to establish criteria for accreditation in the materials community and that's a very important position yeah, yeah. and it was and that's uh, a hard job too and, to and we worked on uh, you know training evaluators right so that and, and developing a system so it was develop uh, evaluator specific <laughs> sure. so that whoever evaluated the program there would be sufficient uh, feedback and uh, oversight by uh, groups to make sure that whatever they were saying about a program was something that right. the community as a whole agreed with. And, uh, and I was involved with establishing those sorts of policies and procedures within the materials community. That's very critical and very important. Yeah. Yeah, it was, and it's, it was again very, and I learned a lot. I mean, every time I went to another university, uh, as an evaluator or as the head of a team for accreditation, I would learn something. Sure. I mean, you, you could learn from other people. They always had something they did that was a little better than what you did, That's and right. you go back with it. That's right, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your awards and honors. I think that um, Sagamore of the Wabash, let's start with that one. How did that come about? Did you know it was coming? No. I usually ask people that. I, 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 <laughs> I had Sometimes no... They say yes, sometimes no. No, I had no idea that was coming, and uh, uh, that was a composite of some of my friends around here who, who were uh, well connected with the political system in the state, and uh, that was presented to me on my retirement uh, okay. party, and so it's... Uh, and it's nicely framed. It's nicely framed in my study, and uh, it's one of the few things I really, you know, keep up there. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, and you're a fellow of the American Society for Medals. Yeah. That uh, your Alumni Foundation Teaching Incentive Award you got. Sometime oh, that back. was uh, yeah, sometime back. That was way back, and that was a point in time that Purdue was trying to put an emphasis on teaching sure. in there. And uh, there were uh, Alumni Foundation awards. To, prior to that, there wasn't a whole lot of recognition outside of a, a school or department. Sure. Uh, about this, and so uh, they developed that, and I was fortunate to get yeah. one of those awards right. in the early days. You, uh, the Distinguished Service Award from to your society, TMS. 
Uh, that Very. was just in recognition of... But that's nice. Uh, uh, well, it's a recognition of getting old. You know, I, I had been a member there for so long and been involved with so many different things. That, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a polite way to put somebody out to pasture. You know. All right. right. I'll let that ride. All right. How about family? Talk a little bit about that. Uh, uh, my wife, Carol, I was, got married in 57. Did you meet your wife here? No. Oh. No. I met my wife was a blind date on uh, 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 New Year's Eve in 1956. You had a blind date on New Year's Eve? Yeah. Okay. Well, she was working in Minneapolis as a buyer at one of the big department stores there, and uh, she was living with a bunch of uh, kids that I had gone to high school with. Sure. And I was coming back to Purdue from uh, spending uh, the Christmas holidays with my parents uh, were in Fergus Falls, and we came. Uh, I came through, and they fixed me up with a date Good. Uh, with Carol, and uh, we hit it off very well. And uh, in whatever, in a year plus, a year and a half later, we got married. And I think, if I recall it correctly, in that year and a half. We had been together four or five times. Cause she was in Minneapolis and I was here, so it was a letter writing uh, deal. And so we got we got married, and uh, and she thought that was a good thing because I was going to get my degree and go out to some nice big city and do things, and that, that didn't quite happen. And, uh, but we had we had two daughters okay. in there. Uh, Did they go to Purdue? Uh, both of them got their bachelor's degrees out of Purdue, um, not because we pushed it, that was their choice uh, uh, to go. Uh, and they both, uh, the eldest got her degree in horticulture here, and uh, my youngest spanned a whole spectrum. She was in geoscience for a couple of years because in that era, was uh, oil crisis and that looked like a good thing for her to earn money and she was a horse crazy uh, young lady and so she felt she could earn big bucks and support her horse habit uh, in there and uh, she was a very good student in there and, and but geoscience was not her area so she tried in uh, interdisciplinary engineering for a year and then her senior year she found history and she got her degree in history. Now, as often told my friends here at Purdue in the liberal arts area, I said, she is the only one that is liberally educated <laughs> out of here because she had all the mathematics, the physics, the chemistry, <laughs> uh, as well as the liberal arts <laughs> things. And, uh, and they both went on and got their uh, PhDs uh, oh, okay. elsewhere. The, Eldest did her work at the University of Minnesota in horticulture, and uh, Janice, the younger one, uh, went to uh, University of Toronto and got her degree in uh, history in the Middle Ages era uh, in there. And um, Barbara, the oldest, is now at uh, West Virginia State University, and she runs a research program there for them. And Janice, the younger one, is at uh, Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario, where she teaches history uh, up there. So we have a nice spectrum uh, within right. the family. That's very yeah. good. That's yeah. nice. But and I, sh I should tell you one thing. On, on go ahead. My youngest brother, Bob, is also a graduate from Purdue. Oh, okay. And Bob came here, you know, whatever, long after. I mean, he was almost 15 years younger than I. But the interesting little comment in there, one day in the 60s, Bob was a student here in the uh, um, late 60s, early 70s. All right, now, my two daughters were at that time, you know, like six and nine or something like that. And I got a call in my office from the registrar's office saying, we need to get in contact with your son. <laughs> and they thought Bob was my son just because he had the last same last name, and, uh, and so we we had some hilarious things going because uh, everybody <laughs> thought he was my son instead of my brother. <laughs> uh, oh, 
Oh dear. How about a Purdue tradition? Do you have a favorite Purdue tradition? Uh, that's. Uh, that's. I, I mean, I. I I Did always, you like athletics or commencement? Or well, I, well, yeah, it's on, on commencement. There was one year in which uh, they played a different song for the commencement coming in, uh, in there. And I mentioned to the president, uh, because it's head, I had to sit up there and on the stage in there. And I said, that's disappointing. I mean, that's not tradition, you know. You know, there is one song that always went with graduation, and I then they changed it back, so I don't know whether they're still doing it. <laughs> but um, you know, I I enjoyed that. Uh, you know, I liked you know the the Boilermaker special is in there, uh, and the one thing I you know I'm I'm searching for is you know when they started in the late '60s, the I Am an American in there, and Johnny DeCamp did it. And uh, you know Johnny is the voice of right. Purdue. Uh, I've been trying to lay my hands on Johnny doing that, and I haven't yet found the, that. Uh, my check my face with his wife. I don't know what. Well, she was that's right. A friend of mine is actually going to talk to him, but uh, she I've may had, have something. Uh, my two daughters have asked me to find that because you know, yeah. that's. Roy Johnson does it now. Oh, I know, I know, yeah, yeah I know Roy right. Roy did, but it was Johnny DeCamp who did it. That my daughters remember the first time he did it, and I do. I mean, it was so striking uh, in there. And that would be nice. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. yeah. How about an outstanding event? Outstanding. Or you can have more than one. Oh boy, I I think everything around here was was just interesting. Uh, the experiences were just a wide spectrum. Uh, you know, I tell a little you know, sort of story. Um, uh, the treasurer of the university, he and I had various conflicts going. As I kept telling him, you know, that, that my job was to figure out how to get around his rules and regulations to get the job done, and his job was trying to figure out how to close up the loopholes that I found in there. <laughs> and we did that for many a year in there. Uh, but uh, 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 the event when they, when we designed it and built the uh, uh, materials and electrical engineering building and blocked off the main entrance to the university that used to come into Hubbardy Hall, which was somewhat traumatic here uh, and there, and uh, you know a lot of alums were very disturbed. You know, you're going to ruin. Uh, the entrance to the university. Well, what some people may not know, uh, that building was actually redesigned to meet some of these interests in there. Uh, and if you go across the street, stand in front of the information center, and look through that building, if the light doesn't blind you, if you don't do it in the morning, you will see Hovde Hall framed in that arched window. Now I sat with the architect. So did Dick Schwartz. We sat, and we had a little pencil man, and he was looking through that building with the, you know, a six-foot-tall person looking through there would see Hovde Hall. And uh, that was all great. But what we lost was the center. The second floor had to be opened up to the third floor in that center part. So we lost a lot of square footage in that yes, building. I see that, yeah. To a but it, I mean, it turned out very nice. I mean, very it's a, so. a gorgeous place in there. Really nice, yeah. yeah. How about retirement activities? Tell us what you've been involved in. And that, for the researchers, you left the community after you retired. Yeah, um, and uh, you know, as... Had you been to North Carolina before? Did oh, you yeah, pick yes. That? Oh, okay. My wife and I had decided Ten years before I was retired, that we wanted to leave and move elsewhere, and I, I felt personally that I'd been the head of the school for twenty some years, and I, it wasn't going to be fair for me to stick around for somebody to come in. It much better if I was away, and uh, and we wanted to get away and redefine our lives, and we had started looking for places that had uh, uh, a 
four seasons, but milder than here. We wanted good health care facilities. Mm -hmm. My wife was in the arts community, so she wanted a big arts, and we wanted an airport close. So we actually looked all around, even outside the country, <laughs> for places to go to. It and takes a while because and we found, look, right? we found this down there in the mountains of western North Carolina. Uh, we were we had been down there and visited it three or four or times to cover the seasons to see what it was like. And then uh, uh, in 1996, we were down there and we went by this place and they were opening up the top of the mountain there. And uh, Carol got we're up. building. Yeah, and, and looked up. It looked out over there where uh, uh, the lot was, uh, they were having to sell lots in there and you looked out and you saw the Blue Ridge Mountains off in the distance uh, and my wife said we, our marriage can stand one more house and so we bought the lot and uh, built there and, and then, uh, you know, I, June 30th, 5 o'clock in 1999, I had already moved Carol down to the new house in western North Carolina in Hendersonville. And uh, I got up, I handed Donna Bystrom, my assistant, the keys to the Chem and Met building. Or the Chem Met, the, uh, MSW. Chem, materials and Electrical Engineering building. Picked up my suitcase, a fishing rod, walked down to the Union, stayed overnight and took a uh, the limo down to the airport to flew, fly back to North Carolina. Prior to that day, I had given my car away to somebody here in the community who needed a car, and she paid me a dollar for it. It was about a 10-year-old car, but still good. And so, so I, so I, in essence, spent my first night at Purdue at the Union and my last night at Purdue in the Union, and uh, so it kind of puts it together. We put it all together. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it was fun. Did you do yeah. any traveling while you were, when after you first moved down or not? Uh, well, my wife suffered a stroke in six months after we moved down there. So. Oh dear. <coughs> uh, and um, she had had heart bypass and had a stroke, and but we got her out of that, and uh, we went on to uh, tour Alaska for two weeks uh, after that, and and we. We went to a number of events in Europe, uh, in Germany and uh, Spain, and then we took uh, cruises. Uh, so you were able to do some things, which is oh nice. yeah, we did yeah. we did things, and then she had she was limited uh, in there because of the stroke. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, no, and I still do that. But, uh, and I, but I enjoy my retirement. That's nice. No, yeah. balls in your court. As you look back and look ahead, and you kind. Of, Comments that I, something I may not have covered. Oh. No, I can't think. Uh, not a whole lot. I mean, there were a couple of interesting past things if you wanted out for that. Go ahead. Just for the, uh, uh, I say you know the the treasurer. He and I had some conflicts going, and at my retirement party, he came with a letter I had written him seven or eight years ago, uh, longer. And he said he wanted to show people the only letter that Lidl had ever written to the upper administration giving them praise instead of criticism. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, that was of interest. And, uh, you know, probably the other interesting event was when I was first on the faculty, we had la uh, laboratories in the s second floor of the Chem and Met building. We had a lot of photography, so there were photography labs. And we would develop film in, in there and the head's office was right below, two of them. Well, one night we were running water and uh, the negatives got covered over the drain and water came up over the drain, went down into the pipes, into uh, the globes at those times, they had those big globes uh, in there, filled with water. So what happens when the head of the department showed up the next morning and hit the switch <laughs> and blew up these things <laughs> in there? And I, I think Reinhard Schumann uh, had a hard time uh, <laughs> handling that. Handling that. I, I mean, we had to 
change all sorts of procedures so that would never happen again. <laughs> right. I get the message. Yeah. <laughs> right. but, uh, uh. No, it, it, there were just wondrous things throughout all, the, the whole time. I mean, it was a great experience, and I was fortunate to be involved when a number of major changes took place uh, right. around here, and uh, I enjoyed each and every one right. of them. And, all the people I dealt with, uh, you know, it was, I was just blessed with being able to become involved with many different things throughout the years. And uh, uh, I say, you know, I'm probably one of the few people who has never interviewed for a job that he got. <laughs> Every job from being recruited down here, somebody was asking me to do something. Going into graduate school, the same thing, I got that. Being asked to join the faculty without applying for the job, which you can't do that these days, but, uh, and then being asked to be head of the school. All right. So I've, Good never, point. I've never interviewed for anything. It's okay. You yeah. did all right. Well, I, I, I think I, I, I survived in That's there. That's right. And yeah. now you're here for the big anniversary this weekend, yes. which is nice. Yes, for the 50th anniversary of the beginning school. of the School of Materials Engineering, right. yes. which and has changed its name over the years. That's right. That's very nice. Thank you, Dr. Lytle. I appreciate right. that. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <clears throat>